Hello, and thank you for inviting us to the Neural Information Processing Hello, and thank you for inviting us to the Neural Information Processing Systems Annual Meeting. My name is Natalie Guerrero, and I'm a research scientist within Facebook Reality Labs. Together with my colleagues, we would like to present you the work our team has been doing on non-invasive neural interfaces. In these presentations, my colleague and I will talk about four main topics. We will start by describing the Control Lab's vision, talk about the genesis of an idea and how it led to a lot of neuroscience research, which was also translated into hardware and software engineering work. We'll talk about some of the foundational progress we have made over several years, describe some of the research we have done within Facebook Reality Labs, along with some cutting edge demo videos that we will show you, and finally show you some of our most recent work, some of which is still very much in progress. Control Labs was founded in 2015, based on a pretty simple premise. When humans interact with technology, we tend to have a pretty high bandwidth for input. We are surrounded by various screens and multiple sound sources, and it turns out we are remarkable at managing that high bandwidth input. But our daily output is limited to typing on a small screen, like our phones or a watch, a keyboard at best, especially in the last few years. It's quite limiting and strongly contrasts our input capacities. This led to an idea for a framework that would expand the bandwidth of human output. And this idea was really framed in an understanding of the basis of how we interact with our environment through our motor system. Here you're looking at a snippet of EMG signals, which is short for electromyography signals. These signals are recorded by electrodes placed on the skin, and the activity you see is controlled by brain circuits that drive descending motor pathways. This is how your muscles are activated, and through the musculoskeletal system, you're able to move and produce outputs that can be detected by different transducers, such as microphones, keyboards, mice, touch screens, and others. In turn, these transducers translate motor commands into something that the computer understands. So the simple idea that was the foundation of control apps was, what if we bypassed all those middle steps? Let's go directly from neural signals, aka EMG, to machine control and increase the bandwidth of our output. Now, the idea of translating neural signals into command is not quite new and describes the entire BCI field, short for, short for brain computer interfaces. The novelty lies in using ENG signals to do so, and there are many reasons why this is an excellent idea. One of the pain points of the BCI field is a trade-off between the spatial resolution and temporal resolution of the signal of each recording device and sight. You can see on this plot, for example, that where the bottom left corner shows recording technologies that maximize the resolution of both uh, spatial and temporal uh, dynamics. As you can see, the technologies that are maximizing both are either cumbersome or invasive or both. And the nice thing about EMG is that it is non-invasive, it can be light and portable, and it captures the neural activity at a very high temporal resolution. It can be on the orders of a few milliseconds, but it can also capture a very high spatial resolution as we're able to probe single motor neurons. What EMG signals read 
Our comments that essentially stem from the brain's motor cortex and travel through motor neurons to the peripheral nervous system. These motor neurons transmit action potential, potentials or spikes to your muscles in a complex called the motor unit. The motor unit is composed by a single motor neuron, which is connected to a number of, of muscle fibers. The motor neuron innervates the muscle fibers at the innervation zone. Muscle fibers act as amplifiers for the neural signal, and that's what EMG takes advantage of. These subcutaneous, relatively high amplitude signals that propagate along the muscle fiber, creating fields, which can be detected as the surface by electrodes. These electrodes can be monopolar, bipolar, or differential. A motor unit action potential is comprised by the signal coming from all the fibers in the motor unit. Knowing that, the following question arises, which is, where do you want to put an array of electrodes to detect motor commands? Where would it be more impactful? Well, there are a few good reasons why the obvious answer is the hand. First of all, as human beings, we, ha we have incredible dexterity and we use our hands in complex daily tasks without even thinking too much about it. This is highly driven by the size of the cortical area that is dedicated to that part of the body. It is also due to the anatomy of the hand itself. Even very simple movements activate sets of muscles in a very specific spatio-temporal pattern. These realizations led to control labs designing a device to be worn around the forearm. And what started as an idea took shape and started living and evolving. Let's see where it has taken us over the last five years. The first thing we realized is that we needed to build incredible hardware to be able to detect the signals and use them. Do machine learning and build inference models that would allow us to understand based only on EMG what the hand was doing. So for example, in this figure, you see five minutes of EMG recording on which we have detected three different motor unit action potentials. Each little uh, red dot is the peak of a spike, and we can detect and distinguish those three uh, motor unit action potential by merely the height of that spike. You can see here the temporal resolutions of each snippet around a single peak. And you can see how well we can really distinguish between, between these three different uh, motor unit action potentials. And it's really remarkable. And this is done with an earlier prototype of the device. But still, it's portable, it's wireless, and it uses dry electrodes, getting the signal to noise ratio at such a low level so that we can distinguish motor unit action potentials was a remarkable feat achieved by our hardware engineering team. We've had some truly exceptional experts guiding us through this research program. Our scientific advisors, who are all the absolute top of the field. These include Liam Paninsky from Columbia, Krishna Shinoi from Stanford, Dario Farina from the Imperial College in London, John Krakauer from Johns Hopkins, and Daniel Wolpert from Columbia. Our initial focus was developing models based on biomimetic control. Biomimetic control boils down to movements of your hand that are usually comfortable in doing, like pinches, snaps, a fist, an open hand. The question is, given a 16-channel signal and knowing the underlying hand anatomy, can we reconstruct what the hand is doing? So that's what we wanted to model. This is the first out of several demo videos we will show you. In this video, one of our co-founders, Thomas Reardon, is wearing a, an older version of the device. He's using a model that is operating in real time, which has been trained to reconstruct motor intention. In other words, what he wants his hand to be doing. As we evolved the model and perfected the metrics, we got to some really remarkable levels of accuracy. In this video, you can see that their construction is independent of arm position. It doesn't really require anything that a computer vision reconstruction would. For example, it can work behind your back. And the most remarkable thing is that it doesn't reconstruct your actual hand, but what you want your hand to be doing, the intent. So even if he's squeezing his fingers to not extend because he wants to extend, the model can decipher that intent and decode it, and you can see the result on the reconstructed hand. One of the very strong advantages of EMG relative to computer vision-based systems is that through EMG, we can naturally detect force levels. 
This has a whole new degree of freedom through which you can output much finer control. For example, you could be using it to modulate the volume of an audio device. Many of these biomimetic models were the basis of our early work, and we have advanced this quite substantially. Here you see one of my colleagues wearing the latest version of our hardware. He's using a model that can detect pinches, squeezes, wrist rolls, snaps, and thumbs up. It is invariant to the pose of his hand. My colleague can trigger the model even from behind his back. And with minimum latency, as you can see, which is one of the desirable characteristics of such a system. More importantly, these are all quite comfortable and subtle movements. Movements that you could imagine even doing with your hands in your pocket. One of, our, one of our most recent models is a nice example of how this technology can provide us with a simple and seamless way of control. You can see how a simple swipe of the thumb across the index finger can be used to navigate a screen full of pictures. In this video, my colleague can navigate up and down, left and right, and he can select or deselect an image. The examples which we have shown you so far are relatively low bandwidth. Our scientists have also developed high bandwidth models that allow a user to type without an actual keyboard. Using data from two bands, this model is highly personalized with that user's neural signature, radically increasing the capabilities of text entry. The typing takes place on a simple surface like a table, and the model detects the relative position of each finger to produce text, which is perfected with the addition of a language model. Our best text model begin to approach some of our fastest typers internally, which is a remarkable proof of concept upon which we're going to continue investigating and improving. What you've seen so far is a pipeline including detailed signal processing and highly advanced modeling work, which has been carried out by the scientists in our team and supported by an amazing team of software engineers, hardware engineers, and interaction scientists. Towards the end of last year, Control Labs joined Facebook Reality Labs. Facebook Reality Labs is a group of researchers, engineers, and developers working together to build the future of augmented and virtual reality. And within Control Labs, we believe that uh, neural interfaces are going to be fundamental towards achieving this goal. In the next set of slides, we're going to show a few videos sh demonstrating how our models can be used to interact with virtual environments. <clears throat> in this first video, we're showing how one of our hand models can be used in a virtual environment. You can see that gestures can be robustly det detected. One of the additional benefits of Surface GMG-based input is that in addition to robustly detecting gestures, we can also detect force. So in this video, the user is clenching his fist with various degrees of force, and that changes the way he interacts with the object. This gives users an additional dimension through which to provide feedback and allows for higher fidelity and more realistic virtual experiences. In this next video, we're showing how, through a series of gestures, a user is able to grab an object and manipulate it. So here, the index pinch is used to grab a block, and then a series of other middle, ring, and pinky pinches are used to manipulate the object. Finally, in this example, we're showing how a series of low energy discrete gestures can be used to interact with an application. Here, the user is using a series of thumb swipes in order to navigate through a series of applications and select a playlist from a music application. Now, those are all exciting uh, demonstrations of our current models, but given that we're currently at NeurIPS and our current audience, we also wanted to discuss how, within Control Labs, we're using recent advances in machine learning in order to improve our models. So in the next set of slides, we're going to discuss how uh, we've used recent uh, improvements in machine learning in order to, to, to improve the overall performance of our models. So one exciting recent avenue of research within machine learning is the use of contrastive losses in order to build in desired invariances into our representations. And within Control Labs, there's a whole series of invariances we wish our representations to learn. In particular, we wish to have uh, representations that are invariant to session. That means that data collected across various sessions uh, should not have representations that encode session information. 
And so in this example, we collected data whilst users were typing on a QWERTY keyboard. Um, and in this left plot here, we're showing a, a two-dimensional projection of this data uh, across four distinct sessions. And the various points here uh, are colored by the keystroke that was being typed. And so you can immediately see that this initial two-dimensional projection doesn't necessarily respect any of the structure we would expect in the data. In particular, the various keystrokes don't appear to cluster together. In fact, we see four approximately large clusters here, and these correspond to the four distinct sessions. So, so we can see that actually our representations are encoding some sort of session uh, information, which is not desirable. In order to address this, we've experimented with the use of, con of, of contrastive losses in order to encourage our representations to be invariant across sessions. What we're showing in this right panel here is the equivalent two-dimensional projection when we add these uh, contrastive losses. Now you can clearly see that this projection does respect the sort of clustering structure we would expect across keystrokes. Furthermore, you can see that keystrokes that appear to be close together in this projection are also keystrokes that are close together on a QWERTY keyboard, as you would expect. A further class of invariants that we wish to account for within Control Labs is a rotational invariance. So each time a user takes off and puts on a band, the location of the electrodes on the wrist will be slightly different. This means that we're measuring EMG data from slightly different locations. To sort of make this clear, in this figure here, we have um, a cross-section of, of muscle activity for two distinct sessions. And each session is colored in red or green, respectively. So you can see that there are some similarities in, this, in, in the activities, but there does seem to be some sort of rotational offset, suggesting that the locations of the electrodes in each of these two measurements was slightly different. On the right, we're showing the same uh, map for, for, for these uh, sessions once we've applied a rotational Eynant algorithm so that the electrodes in, in, in both these sessions have been sort of corrected to map onto some canonical location on the wrist. And now you can see there's much clearer overlap between the two act the activations across both sessions. Finally, we're also interested in building physiologically interpretable EMG models. Uh, so here we're showing uh, a matrix of observed spike counts uh, across uh, 30 motor units. And we might want to decompose this matrix as, um, as being generated by some latent muscle activities, which we have to infer. Furthermore, we, want, we might, might, might want these muscle activities to sort of respect some sort of temporal smoothness constraints, but also some sort of spatial constraints so that these muscles should only really activate or be measured primarily at a subset of the 16 electrodes. And that's what we're showing here. In the next set of slides, we want to give some examples of the interactions and neuroscientific research that we're doing at Control Labs. In this first example, we're showing how we can learn adaptive models, which iteratively learn from the user's EMG data. What we're showing here on the left is uh, raw EMG data across a single user as he performs a series of thumb swipes in order to control uh, this sort of pink marker shown here. Now, the purpose of the goal here is to move the pink marker to the light green square. And so um, one of the things we're particularly interested in Control Labs is how we can take user EMG data and adaptively, over a short period of time of the order of seconds, adapt and uh, refine our models so that they're better suited to each user. And what, we'll, what we can see in this video is as the user progresses, he should, he should iteratively be able to solve the problem faster and faster as the model becomes more personalized and better suited to him. Now, this is particularly important to us as we want our models to be able to be used by everyone, uh, in particular, for example, users that may have suffered some form of injury, and so the nature uh, of their EMG data may be very, very different. Another uh, neuroscientific question that we're very excited about in Control Labs is whether it's possible to control a single motor unit. Now, the classical theory uh, of motor unit recruitment says that motor units are recruited uh, in correspondence to the force in a staircase fashion. Uh, what this essentially means is that there's a correlation between uh, the recruitment threshold of motor units and the twitch force of, 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 uh, of the muscle fiber. Now, essentially, what this boils down to is the fact that it is not possible for the brain uh, to selectively uh, activate specific motor units. Now, this is a hypothesis that within Control Labs, we're actually contesting a little bit. And in fact, it's not just us. There's actually research going back to the 60s, uh, as we're showing here, um, using a somewhat uh, invasive experimental setup, uh, which showed that it was in fact possible to uh, detect uh, and control individual motor units. And so for us, this is particularly, particularly exciting because it means that if we're able to control individual motor units, this can serve as a one-bit encoding of information uh, that we can control. And so this is not something that we're just interested in. It's also something that we've, we've put into practice.
So in this video here, we actually trained a model uh, to, to respond to the activation of a single motor unit. So at first, the dinosaur is, is being made to jump using the space bar, but thereafter, it's actually responding to the activation of a single motor unit. And what this means is that the user is able to make the dinosaur jump using very small and imperceptible uh, motor movements, and he's able to do it uh, in, a, in, a, in various different sort of gestures or positions, so either crossing his arms or with his hands in his pockets, as shown there. Now, a related but, but separate uh, area of neuroscientific research that we're also interested in is the independent uh, uh, control of, of motor units on the same recruitment curve. So what we're showing here on the left are the waveforms for two motor units, which we believe uh, are from the same muscle and lie on the same recruitment curve. Uh, and what we're showing in, th in this video here is how the user is able to um, select either the left or the right uh, waveform here in order to move this cursor to the left or the right respectively. And so you can see that the first couple of trials, the user is able to move the cursor to the right. And now he's, he's asked to move the cursor to the left. And so he's able to do so just by uh, activating the sort of left um, uh, motor unit. And so this suggests that despite the fact that these motor units may lie on the same recruitment curve, we are in fact able to activate them independently. And so actually this was a, this took various days of training for, for the user to learn to do this. And in fact, on, on the first day of training, which is shown here, the user was not able to, to independently activate these two separate motor units. So what's shown here is a sort of training paradigm, which involved various trials. So in, in red, we're showing trials where the user was asked to move the cursor to the right. And in blue, we're showing trials where the user was asked to move the cursor to the left. And what we can see is the user was able to successfully complete the blue trials, that is um, activate just the sort of left motor unit, if you will, um, without activating the right motor unit or the red motor unit. And this is because this motor unit uh, uh, was before uh, the other unit on the, on the recruitment curve. However, when the user was asked to, to just activate the, the red or the right motor unit without activating the, the blue motor unit, he was not able to do so, as we can see in those red trials. And so this, this, this training procedure was repeated over, over a series of days. And so you can see that finally on, on like the seventh day of training, the user was indeed able to uh, independently activate either the left or the right uh, motor units depending, depending on the trial. And so again, this is an exciting uh, result for us because it means that we're able to, to increase the bandwidth of, of input for users uh, through which they can provide information. And so that, that concludes this, this presentation. Um, we are around to take questions during a Q&A, but before we do, we would like to highlight that we are in fact currently recruiting uh, for roles both in, in New York and in the Bay Area. Uh, and so if you're interested, please do reach out to us, or you can also uh, contact us through uh, facebook.com slash careers.